Welcome to another week of Trashy Divorces. I'm Stacy. Hey, y'all. I'm Alicia. Welcome back. This week, I'm so excited. I love this song. I actually love this song, too. The Lady is a Tramp, introduced in the Rogers and Hart musical Babes in Arms, starring Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. Mm. The early recording of the song The Lady is a Tramp is done by Tommy Dorsey and his orchestra. Lena Horne will go on to record this in the 1940s. Recorded a lot in the 1950s, including notably by Ella Fitzgerald. So good. And that's actually a CD in my car at the moment. Frank Sinatra will sing this in the film Pal Joey to Rita Hayworth, too. It's a good song. It's such a good song. This week, Stacy, you have... I have Shirley MacLaine. She's all over the place, but she's also a terrible mother, so... <laughs> Woo! And you have a Trashy Divorces All-Star. Oh my God. Zsa Zsa Gabor. Nine husbands, seven divorces, one annulment. Love her to many. She's got a lot of dudes. She usually gets some wealth out of it, unless it's Frank Sinatra. She actually sleeps with him just so he will move his car out of her driveway. I mean, it, sure. This sure, season sure. has gone to... Mm-hmm unexpected galaxies yes and universes yes and on that topic of other other places let's talk about patreon y'all big week on patreon good week you had your synagogue of the flaming dumpster fire indeed yep we did a two-parter about the trashy courtship and wedding of john kennedy and jackie bouvier we had some new people this week Legit. Team Trash Candy is the best community it, it around. Is, it is. Yes. In the Magic Mirror this week, we have Rachel J, Joe C, Skylar MW, Sarah L, Allie T, Gail P, April, Rebecca P, Kimberly L, Claudia V, Monica M, Sophie B, Emily D, Gabrielle K, and RP. And we have some super supporters, oh too. Oh, my gosh. On our Trash Candy connoisseur level. Mm-hmm. We have Jenna SK, Cohen B, and Rachel S. Thank all of you for joining and upgrading. All of our new patrons, our old patrons, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are the best. Simply the best. What's better than the best? Because that's what our Patreons are. Exceptional. Out of this world. Out of this world. Ah. Okay. Hey, y'all, before we start the show, I want to remind everybody, I, it's kind of exciting, have an art show Saturday, March 7th, next Saturday night at Kavarna in Oakhurst. We're going to have music by Lori Ray, and there will be sassy and trashy art all over the walls. So much. And you will be drinking again. Uh, You will be having a glass of wine. I will indeed. Yes. Come say hi if you're in Atlanta. Yeah. In the Atlanta area or surrounding area. Yeah. Come on out to Decatur. Come say hey. Get some art. Hear some tunes. Mm -hmm. Kavarna in Oakhurst. See Stacy after she succeeded at Dry February. We will be Ubering there and back. Oh, always, always. is a handy, handy thing. Also, we need your trashy divorces. We need your listener letters. We've got another fun uh, bonus ep coming up. What are your Irish-themed being green? Put a clover on it. Put a four-leaf clover on it. Trashy divorces. The time you divorced a leprechaun. That is the story that we really want you to send in mm-hmm. to trashy divorces at gmail.com. We really do. We can't wait to hear about your trashy leprechaun divorce. We genuinely can't wait to hear about your trashy leprechaun divorce. Oh, Danny boy. Hey, Stacy. Mm-hmm. I've heard that we never dish the dirt with the rest of the broads. Hmm. Uh, it's actually kind of the opposite. We... We have our our trash pandas, though. Our trash candy pandas. I guess it's the same. They're in the club. We dish the dirt with them all the time. Yeah. You ready to start the episode? May as well. Go, go, go. That's why the lady is a tramp. So, Stacy, this week you are giving a much larger story to an actress who only had an uncredited role in... Ocean's Eleven as Tipsy Girl. Yeah, but she was Rat Pack adjacent, and this would actually end up playing a gargantuan role in the 
quote unquote parenting style of the actress Shirley MacLaine. I can't wait to hear this story. Yeah, she was good friends with the Rat Pack for a lot of years. They were they were tight, thick as thieves. I'm going to talk to you about Shirley MacLaine like you're 10 years younger than I am and only have a passing familiarity with... She's in her 80s now. She's, I mean, she's an amazing... She's legendary. She's legendary. Mm -hmm. But maybe, like me, you're not so familiar with her as the actress of great range because mostly I think these days... As a youth? As a youth, we tend to think of her as some sort of new agey... Is the word kook okay? (laughs) She's a little ethereal. She's a little ethereal. There you go. Well said. So, yes, for this season, I was aware of Sinatra and Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis and Sammy Davis and, you know, everybody. But I just happened to miss the part of their lives where they were, like, young and new and fresh on the scene and peak of their careers and all of that. They were all just, like old people they were middle age when we were kids mm-hmm. like yeah. middle age and older so you're done washed up who right so it's been interesting to kind of dig in and this one as well um so shirley mclean was born shirley mclean Beatty on april 24th 1934 so she's a cuspy what is that aries taurus she's an aries taurus cusp which mm-hmm. is also known as the cusp of power Or as we like to say, the cups of power because we can't talk. Okay. Shirley was born to two would-be performers. Her father had been a musician before growing up or settling down or whatever it is that adults who frequently tell their children that they wish they could run away and join the circus do. What? mm -hmm, Yeah. And her mother had been an amateur actress and worked as a drama teacher. To hear Shirley tell it, both of her parents had very clearly taken a path that left them wanting and she just, she talks about how, like, she and her brother is Warren Beatty. And so, like, she and Warren just didn't really factor into their parents' thing. Anyway. God bless birth control, <laughs> right? Like, how does that let a woman make a different decision in their life if they're not wanting to be a mom? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So Shirley was named for Shirley Temple, who oh. uh, was the world's most famous six-year-old when Shirley MacLaine was born. She's the older sister of Warren Beatty. And clearly, you know, there was something in that household that was encouraging creativity, let's say, even if her parents themselves felt that their own had been quashed by the getting married and having kids thing. Well, yeah, you have two kids that grow up in two creative endeavors. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Shirley was also born with bad ankles, and to try to help her correct that, her mom enrolled her in ballet class when she was all of three. And uh, in recent years, McLean has said that this was when her life aligned with her dreams, and she has lived her own way ever since the age of three. She loved it. She loved when ballet. When you find what you love mm-hmm. when you're young. Mm-hmm. And then I think fortunately for her, she ended up being quite tall, which doesn't really work for a ballerina because it's difficult to partner. Anyway, so she probably would have stuck with dance had that not been the case. But instead, she just didn't have basically the right body for being a professional ballerina. So she ended up looking at acting. Okay. That. Singing, dancing. Being a star. Doing the thing. Apparently, you can just show up in Hollywood and they're like, hey, kid, want to be a star? In New York City in her case, but yeah. Oh, yeah, Close enough. Totally. So the summer after her junior year of high school, she's growing up in Virginia, by the way. So she goes to New York City. She wins a part in Oklahoma and I guess was good enough and pleasant enough to work with that Rogers and Hammerstein asked her to travel to London with the show. Holy cats. And pick it up there. And her parents were like, you know, what would be cool is, I don't know, graduating for, from high school. So her parents who've only wanted to be performers are like, hey, kid, you need to get your degree and not go perform with Rogers and fucking Hammerstein well, just in a London. High school, just a high school degree. Anyway. Oh my God, go finish your degree next year. Go to London. She, um, I think the deal was that they would support her after graduation, like they would absolutely have her back at that point. Anyway, so she goes home to Virginia and she does graduate from high school. And then, yeah, she's out the door back in New York auditioning for plays. 
1954, she became understudy to the actress Carol Haney in The Pajama Game. Ah. Haney injured her own ankle during the run, which is where Shirley first caught the attention of Hal B. Wallace, who signed her to Paramount Pictures. Wow. A few months later, Haney, I don't know, has a sore throat, something, can't go on. And Shirley MacLaine hops out, Stepping does right the up. role, and in the audience is, I think it was one of Hitchcock's talent scouts. Oh. I wrote Alfred Hitchcock, but I, I think they actually met later. Anyway, though, it was decided that Shirley MacLaine would be great in his next movie, The Trouble with Harry. So then she's got this awesome story that I just loved about meeting Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock is not just English, he's Cockney. Right. And so there's this thing in Cockney linguistics called rhyming slang. It's in other, it's not just Cockney, but apparently it's a thing. So, for instance, Alfred Hitchcock, the first time Shirley MacLaine is on set, walks in, sees this very, very young actress who is terrified. She does not know what she's doing. She is not trained to be an actress. <laughs> it's like... She's sitting there freaking out. And there's Alfred Hitchcock walking into the room. and Which wouldn't make you freak out more no, at all. No, no, no. So he, uh, yeah, <laughs> sort of looks her up and down and then just says, genuine choppa, and walks off. And she's like, what did I just do? The hell is a genuine choppa? Yeah. Um, so it's this, one of the other people on the crew is like, it's, rhyming it's slang it's a cockney thing think about it what's a synonym for genuine she's like i don't know real Mm -hmm. and what's a chopper an axe right he would like for you to relax (laughs) he just he (laughs) coded up a a genuine chopper genuine chopper as a real axe (laughs) please calm down shirley you're freaking out alfred another time they're troubleshooting a scene that wasn't quite working, and Hitchcock says, But before you do that line, dog's feet. Dog's feet? Dog's feet. What the fuck is dog's feet? The roller pause. He wanted her to pause, pause. before delivering that line. <laughs> what a confusing way to manage a crew. I don't know if I've heard ever heard a story about Alfred Hitchcock that I have enjoyed Quite as much as that one. She really likes him. Dog's feet. From what I can tell. He took a shot on her, you know, and it it really paid off. Uh, The Trouble with Harry earned her a Golden Globe Award for New Star of the Year. (laughs) Things were happening in her personal life, too. In 1952, back in New York, she met a guy named Steve Parker, one night after a performance of Me and Juliet. Oh, Steve. He proposed that night, and she accepted the next day. They didn't get married for a couple of years just because they were busy. But it was actually Steve who first turned Shirley MacLaine onto metaphysics when she was working on the Hitchcock movie. He brought her this 1890s book from, you know, a quote-unquote channel, a medium who was do it like a, an Atlantean spirit that he was channeling. Oh, really? Uh-huh. So... Oh my seeds. Okay. Seeds planted. Do you so she's a tourist. Do you happen to know his I don't. Okay, don't worry Steve about Steve Parker. It. Yeah, yeah, it's not a not a big deal. He doesn't have his own Wikipedia page. It's really and he's often referred to as her mysterious husband. Well Apparently he has his own universe and he's no zodiac sign. <laughs> that may be true. That may be true. Okay, so yeah, this book is called A Dweller on Two Planets, and apparently it was super influential to her. Okay. And has shaped her, I don't know, inner life ever World since. World view. World view. Mm-hmm. World's view. Uh-huh, yes. It would there also um, sow some seeds toward the end of the marriage, interestingly enough. Um, this is a very strange story. Tell me more. Her career was full steam ahead. So after The Trouble with Harry, she was in a Martin and Lewis film, Artists and Models. It was their second to last movie. And apparently she just, the clips I've seen, standout performance. Like it just, she was great with those two. So in 56, she was in Around the World in 80 Days, a Mike Todd film. A Mike Todd film. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wow. This is spider webs. Yeah. This was partly filmed in Japan. Steve, weirdly, had spent his 20s in Japan because his dad had a shipping business. 
So, okay. So her boyfriend slash husband, whatever, he's like really into like, yeah, let's go to Japan. That's cool. Fantastic. I'll show you all the good restaurants. I don't know. Whatever. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, he also had a lover there. Ooh. Ooh. This isn't like a huge hindrance to their marriage. It's tr- strange. Okay. She seems pretty chill. She's pretty chill. Okay. Yeah. So her fame knob just keeps getting turned up louder. He is not super cool being Mr. Shirley MacLaine. Like he has a sense of self. And so eventually he's like, you know, California kind of sucks if you're me. And she was like, well, how about Japan? He's like, cool. And she's like, great. Come back sometimes. <gasps> what? Yeah, dude. That's moves, chill, man. Dude moves to Japan. Sets up shop. That is how Shirley MacLaine spent nearly all of her 28-year-long marriage on separate continents. 28 years? From her husband. <gasps> mm-hmm. Yep. It was how they both wanted it. That's trashy in just a dusty kind of way. A little bit. I think the way it worked in practice was, you know, they're based, it's a long distance relationship, but when they do get together a few times a year, like that time is super precious. And, fireworks. Yes. And that seems to be kind of how they set it up. So if she's filming something in Japan, they're a happy family. Anyway. So, you know, at the same time, they both retain their independence. They have freedom to enjoy their lives separately, including with other people. So that was going to be my next question is, so they have agreed, they have agreed mutually to an open marriage. They have the openest of marriages. Wide open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doors flung. They also had a bebe a couple of years into the marriage. This is Sachi. A girl? A girl. And Sachi published her own account of being raised by Shirley MacLaine in 2013 with the book, Lucky Me, My Life with and Without My Mom, Shirley MacLaine. How... Okay. Mm-hmm. How'd that go? Well, <laughs> apparently they were estranged at the time, which is good because they sure are now. Oh. Um, Shirley MacLaine called it a work of fiction, as you would expect. It's, it's not It's not a great story. Ooh. So according to Sachi, the family story for how she came to be raised by her father in Japan, I love this. This is probably not true, but I love it. Okay. When Sachi was two years old, Uncle Frank Sinatra, oh no, who again Shirley McLean is super Rat Pack adjacent, good friends with all of them. Anyway, right. Uncle Frank gets into some trouble with his mafia buddies. Sure, and uh, there oh, were all no. sorts of rumors about just how it was that the mob planned to get Frankie right with them, and one of them, according nope. to Shirley McLean, was that there was a plot out to kidnap Sachi. <gasps> For some reason. Oh. So <laughs> this is not even like, even let's assume that Shirley MacLaine did believe that this was a potential thing. This is still not how a parent would react in that situation. She puts Sachi on an airplane to Japan <gasps> by herself. She Shirley MacLaine does not go on this flight. And back then it wasn't, there wasn't like a direct LA to Tokyo flight like they had to stop in the Wake Islands for refueling they had to stop like it was like a two or three day process how old is this poor child two years (gasps) old and the flight attendants are caring for her the whole time I mean I get the kid get the kid out of danger if Frankie's mafioso thugs are gonna like threaten your child but you get on a plane with your kid I would think yeah yeah, she's, she's also like, safely. what, the mob doesn't know where Japan is? Like, how does this? <laughs> okay. So over in Japan, husband Steve. The cannolis aren't as good, though. Yeah. Husband Steve has settled into a perfectly happy domestic situation with his old lover from back when he was there before the oh war. Oh, my God. Mickey. So, does dad know that kid's on his, on her way? I mean, <gasps> probably. Oh, God. Okay. Must have, right? There must have been at least... A phone call? Telegrams, something. There must have been some, like, you're going to pick her up at the airport, right? Because at two years of age, she probably can't get a cab in Japanese. <laughs> so, Sachi would spend the school year in Japan with family number one. And then in the summers and holidays, she would fly back to Los Angeles to spend the break with her mom, 
who it turns out was not exactly awesome as a mom. For instance, when Sachi was 17, she had a boyfriend, Brad, nice guy, but she was 17. They were, they were making out, but they had not had sex. So mom brings in two sex therapists and what? basically has an intervention with Sachi and Brad to, for and what effectively end? sends them off to like her bedroom to have sex. It, like, mm -hmm. I, this is how she lost her virginity. Oh my was, God. Um, her mom and two sex therapists no. were like, but you must. And then we're all here, so you can come out and talk about it afterwards. And it's very... <clears throat> hmm. It is rare. Mm. Do, you have, do you have things to say about no, that? No, I'm speechless. Yeah, it, I, it I... was... I feel really bad for, for that 17-year-old, like, absolutely... No words. Yeah, yeah. 17 year old just more or less ordered to go have sex with her boyfriend that is some uncom mm -hmm. yeah okay okay so when shirley wasn't being a terrible mother she was often having affairs with glamorous co-stars and other people in and around hollywood and politics and i mean just lots of people so she was notably connected to robert mitchum very broody she liked that about him danny k Ah. The Italian-French actor Yves Montand. Really? <laughs> she had a long-term affair with the Australian foreign minister, a guy named Andrew Peacock. Oh, my. She had an affair with Pierre Trudeau, prime oh. minister of Canada, and Olaf Palm, prime minister of Sweden. Holy cow. She was just like a, just a, just an EU for her time. I don't know. I'm floored. I mean, she she does seem to enjoy discussing all of these uh, in company. So. Well, when you're done doing it, you come out in the kitchen and have a cup of cocoa and let's talk about it with our therapist. I think it's fair to characterize Shirley MacLaine as very focused on her own happiness to the detriment of what others may want, need, feel, whatever. Doesn't matter. Professionally, though, her career was rocking. In 58, she got her first Academy Award nomination for Some Came Running with Frank Sinatra. Ah, fantastic. And I think that's the one where he had them rewrite the ending to give her a more dramatic exit so that she might get nominated for uh, an award. Okay. Which she did. Well, that's nice of him. So, yeah, then the 1960 uncredited role is, what is it? Tipsy Girl. A Tipsy Girl. Mm-hmm. Good choice. And she picked up her second Oscar nomination for The Apartment with Jack Lemmon, also in 1960. That film won five Oscars and surely fully expected to win Best Actress. But Elizabeth Taylor had had a tracheotomy after Butterfield 8. Oh, and she so did. <gasps> apparently there was this rally around our biggest star effect that happened. And so right. she ended up getting the award that year. Shirley's Academy Award. Robbed. <clears throat> Shirley believes she was robbed. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Shirley MacLaine would eventually win an Academy Award for Best Actress in 1983 for the movie Terms oh, of Endearment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she would also famously feud with her co star from that movie, Deborah Winger. Winger sat with Esquire for an interview and was like, Shirley MacLaine is a nightmare. She is self absorbed. She is egotistical. She's constantly blathering about all the affairs she's having with all these men. Oh, my. And. She throws herself multiple birthday parties because once is not enough. All of her lives. <laughs> Come on. Okay. So <laughs> I feel like I feel like between Deborah and Sachi, we're getting sort of a, a pretty consistent picture of Shirley MacLaine, which is not super flattering. But again, she's in her eighties now and you just you can't argue. I mean it's she's a diva. Okay. For the length of her marriage, again, 28-year-long marriage, she would see Steve two or three times a year. They'd have a great time together for at least a few hours, I guess. If she was filming in Japan or he was visiting the States, Sachi does mention that while dad was very busy living the high life, he didn't have any visible means of support. She wasn't oh. really sure how he was paying those huh. bills with his, with his live-in girlfriend, Mickey. Interesting. Um, how was he paying his bills? Hmm. So let's start with 
Shirley MacLaine says that she did not know that he had been living with Mickey for 20 plus years. Oh my. Um, yeah. And he was kind of a crap dad too. Like apparently his nickname for his daughter was idiot and he wouldn't let her read. Well, like that seems very mm, counterproductive. Yeah. Really weird. Okay. So this is the story as I understand it about how this marriage came to its end. And it's as weird as would befit a Shirley MacLaine divorce story. So she's a big believer in UFOs, but boy, does she take it to places. Somewhere over the years, probably a lot of them, husband Steve had convinced Shirley that he was in fact a cloned extraterrestrial and that Paul, his true uncloned self, was actually aboard a spaceship in outer space. And for some reason, it cost $60,000 a month to keep him there. And so Steve was collecting the money from Shirley to pay for Paul's extraterrestrial space adventures. And Paul is the true father of Sachi. Um, Dog's feet. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. $60,000 a month. Again. I repeat back to the Kathy Griffin story. <laughs> Sharing is caring. Stealing is a fucking outright felony. It's a crime. That's criming. Well, okay. So when Shirley MacLaine discovered that it was probably not true, that Steve was a clone and that Paul was her real husband, but he was in space. Oh, what could have left it? What could have revealed the... <gasps> she She divorced him. <sighs> In 1982, because clearly he's a con man. <laughs> okay, weirder still, though, she continued to believe that Steve Parker is a clone, and long after they were divorced, she still referred to him that way. So I guess aliens can be criminals, too? I mean... I What the... He died in 2001, and I... Saw some references that they remained friendly after the divorce. I don't know that they were friends, and I think he was still home-based in Japan, so I'm sure they didn't run into each other that much. But Home-based in the fifth dimension black hole? Yeah. yeah super, super Weird. strange. Uh, interesting, though, that the guy who turned her on to spirituality, metaphysics, all that years before, in the end, was conning her with those same beliefs for... Like, a lot of money, $60,000 a month. For 30 years? I... <sighs> yeah. So, obviously, this duplicity did not turn Shirley MacLaine off of spirituality and her interest in aliens and reincarnation and karma and all of it. All of it. For instance, she believes that in a past life, she lived in Atlantis. Sure. Didn't we all? And that she was the brother of a 35,000-year-old spirit there. Okay. And, like... Sure. You imagine the health insurance costs that go with being 35,000 years old, but... Medicare for all ain't going to cover that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shirley has a, a rich inner life. But, again, it's pretty clear that her devotion to herself has caused real conflict in that life and... Left her only daughter at her wit's end. And, like, Shirley cut Sachi off financially when she was 17, so Sachi didn't go to college. And then later in life, Sachi decided, like, well, I guess I'll go work in Hollywood that, you know, presumably I could make some connections happen. And, like, mom got in the way of that. Really? Shirley MacLaine did not help her daughter. Huh. Like, get her... And, and sometimes she apparently actively sabotaged it. Oh. So her career never really went anywhere. And again, Shirley points back to her own parents and how having kids crushed their souls. And so they couldn't be full watching you couldn't be full people. And she wasn't going to do that to her daughter. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah, they're estranged. They've been estranged for a long time. So, I mean, that is sort of 
the whole thing, uh, this won't be the longest divorce story I've ever presented, but... That's trashy. Felt like the, uh, no, that's not your dad, that's clone Steve. Paul, your dad is in outer space. I, I, and then to have the daughter be like, actually, you know, that's not true. Well, of course it's true. I'm paying $60,000 a month for it. I, Mom. <laughs> Mummy. So wow. I'm... Wow. We're, we've got some... I had no idea. Mommy, you know that... How do I even begin? Stacy, that's a hell of a story. How many uh, trash cans did you... I think that the number... I'm sorry, conjure out of a different universe. I think the number of trash cans here is more or less irrelevant. Um, <laughs> but the diva Shirley MacLaine does get some ancient Atlantean trash cans that sank into the ocean eons ago and are just sitting down there growing barnacles and waiting to be rediscovered. Uh, and there's Shirley MacLaine, everybody. Wow. <laughs> and we'll have some interviews and such. She's hilarious on stage and she just she just takes takes no prisoners in any dimension. I need a break after that. <laughs> Let's dog's feet for a word from our sponsor. That's great. That's great. Back in a minute. Okay, so we are opening a category called Trashy Divorces All Stars. And you have <laughs> sort of a Kardashian of her day. I to, I really uh, do. Uh, total momager. Hmm. Two sisters she made the scene with. Zsa Zsa Gabor, y'all. Hmm. She's a Trashy Divorces All Star. By popular demand. Yeah, for real. Uh, Zsa Zsa Zoom. Today is a quick and dirty primer on a real broad. Let's talk about some stats. Zsa Zsa. Married. Most concede nine times. Seven divorces, one annulment. Why even bother with the annulment? I mean, uh, whatever. Zsa Zsa. <laughs> I wanted to have them always. Has some amazing quotes. I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> talk about a few of these. Zsa Zsa said, a girl must marry for love and keep on marrying until she finds it. I think we will find that come into play in mm -hmm. this story. Big thanks to Melanie Z on this one. Goddess of Trash Candy did some research on this and helped me out. And I am forever grateful. She finds the best stuff. I do love a good quote. Zsa Zsa, who was far more famous for being famous and married than her contribution of work does have some real zingers with quotes. I'm a marvelous housekeeper. Every time I leave a man, I keep his house. Jesus. My husband said it was him or the cat. I miss him sometimes. I always said marriage should be a 50-50 proposition. He should be at least 50 years old and have $50 million. If you're going to just plow through men like this, you may as well make it rich. This is probably my favorite. I never hated a man enough to give him his diamonds back. <laughs> Zsa Zsa Gabor, all-star. She uh, is also famously said, I believe in large families. Every woman should have at least three husbands. Zsa Zsa does take her own advice. The size of her family is in dispute. She claimed she was married eight times. Her last husband swore the final tally was 10. Again, general consensus. Zsa Zsa married nine times. A hubby <clears throat> eight will not count. Because she was married elsewhere and was not already divorced when that one happened. Oh, a little mm -hmm. bigamist union there. Okay. Her husband's included a diplomat, a hotel tycoon, an Oscar-winning actor, an industrialist, an oil magnate, a divorce lawyer, a fake prince, and the guy who invented Barbie. <laughs> she had affairs with Richard Burton, the son of a Dominican dictator, Henry Kissinger, the legendary international playboy who we talked about mm -hmm. last week, Porfirio Rubirosa, who Zsa Zsa called the only man who really satisfied me in bed, present company excluded. 
because that was his profession, how to make love. She was married to George Sanders when she said this, so good. Okay, by some reports, 16-year-old Zsa was named runner-up to Miss Hungary. By others, she was crowned at 15, but disqualified for lying about her age. Hmm. Everyone will agree that she stood trial for slapping a police officer when her roles was pulled over for a traffic violation in the 1980s. Her older sister will work in the anti-Nazi underground during World War II. Her younger sister will go on to star on Green Acres. All three Gabor sisters starred together in their very own Las Vegas nightclub act in the 1950s. It's, okay. Oh, it just gets better. Mm-hmm. Their mother was a costume jewelry designer who embellished the family's origin story the way she'd gussy up a string of fake pearls with genuine diamond clips. As the family's biographer Stam Staggs wrote, intertwining of true and false could have served as the Gabor coat of arms. Zsa Zsa will play a strip club owner in Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, as well as a despotic intergalactic aristocrat in Queen of Outer Space. She guest starred on everything from the facts of life to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air before dying seven weeks before her 100th birthday. Yikes. Zsa Zsa once told People Magazine that her biggest pastime was dressing up and making other women jealous. I love to put on diamonds and beautiful evening gowns and make my girlfriends upset. It's a wonderful feeling. Good people. Good people. Again, some fleeting virtues in this one. Her second biggest pastime, of course, was men. Let's get into it. Zsa Zsa is born Sari Gabor in Budapest, February 6th, 1917. Just want you to remember 1917 because she will repeatedly lie about her age throughout her life. (laughs) No, that makes sense. Aquarius baby. She's a second child of a secular Jewish couple named Vilmos and Jolie Gabor. Her mother is a frustrated actress who claimed to be the heiress to a jewelry fortune. I have read elsewhere that her mother operated a brothel. So a little questionable. According to her obituary in the New York Times, Jolie Kenda was born in Budapest where her father owned a jewelry business. She was sent to a Swiss finishing school but dreamed of becoming an actress. When her parents insisted she marry, she found Vilmos Gabor, a businessman twice her age, and after six miserable months, he agreed to a divorce so she could act. But after becoming pregnant with Magda, she opened a jewelry store instead. She postponed the divorce for what turned out to be 22 years and two more daughters. But did she think that Vilmos was a clone? <laughs> <laughs> Dog's feet. <laughs> Together with Zsa's older sister Magda and her younger sister Eva, the Gabor family lives in an apartment in Budapest, and these girls were groomed to marry very well. So I'm going to revisit her obituary back, mom's obituary back in the times. If Jolie never existed, Dominic Dunn would have had to create her. The mother whose three daughters leave the old country behind and go to America where their beauty, their talent, well, their beauty (laughs) is so irresistible to rich and powerful men they meet that voila, they become rich and powerful too. Jolie Gabor was a marketing genius positioning Magda, Zsa and Eva as the ultimate international beauty queens, glorifying Euro before it turned to trash. Magda soon shunned the spotlight, but Zsa and Eva craved it. Jolie sounds like a real charmer. It's a mm. good quote from her. My daughters know how to ride, to play tennis, ice skate, and all the sports that make up for a social life. Not too much can they do these things. Not too much to make big muscles, but enough to be a charming companion to a man. I see you looking at me like, what are you going to say here? And really just, just, just good people. That's all, that's all I'm going to say here. According to Zsa Zsa, 
The family led a life filled with grace and charm. There were vacations at our house on the shores of Lake Balaton, excursions in our Mercedes, parties glittering with beautiful women and dashing men waltzing together under the flickering light of our crystal chandeliers. 1936. Zsa Zsa's crowned Miss Hungary. Or maybe she was runner-up. Or maybe she was just a finalist. It depends on who's telling the story. Maybe she watched it on TV in her living room. In 1937, Zsa Zsa will find her first husband. You may want to keep a little list over there on your, uh, on your sure. notebook. Sure. She married Berthen Asaf Biage. Beige, B-E-I-G-E. This I'm dude... not up on my Hungarian pronunciation. I'm not either. It, well, he uh, he's a Turkish politician. Hold on. Nor Turkish yeah, pronunciation. This is... Mm-hmm. I need the International School of Pronunciation. He's born February 1st, Berthan, in Istanbul, 1899. Istanbul. Mm. The modern one that has nine separate functions, that's the instant bowl. (laughs) You can steam. You can crock. I'm doing great. I'm on husband number one. Let's start this over. Instant bowl. Berthon is born February 1st, 1899 in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. It's a place. When it was still part of the Ottoman Empire. Not Constantinople. <laughs> Stop yourself. <laughs> Hubby One is a Turkish politician, mm-hmm. prominent intellectual. He meets Jaja when he's a diplomat stationed in Budapest. She proposes to him, but later claims they never consummated the marriage and that she had actually lost her virginity at the age of 15 to Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey. Sure. Ataturk ruined me for every other man I would ever love or try to love, Zsa, Zsa later says. He knew exactly how to please a young girl. He was a professional lover, a god, and a king. Okay. Hubby won. Hmm. Berthon shows Zsa, Zsa more of the world than she'd ever seen thus far. He takes her to London, as well as North America, for the first time. Her horizons thus expanded. She wants out by 1941. Annulment time. 1941. Zsa, Zsa ditches hubby one, packs her 21 suitcases, and GTFO from Europe. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Gets away from, flees the Nazis, and follows her baby sister Ava to America. She travels from Istanbul to Karachi, then makes her way to New York through the Panama Canal, Within 10 months of landing in the United States, she had landed hubby number two. Of course. Hotel magnate Conrad Hilton. He was 55. She is, depending on what day she is, somewhere in her 20s. She could 20s. be 11. Oh, wait for she it. She could be 20. We don't know. 1941, we know, Zsa, we know she's not 11. Yeah. Zsa, Zsa will marry Conrad Hilton Sr., in 1942. Remember, his son... Right, married Liz Taylor. Correct. Okay, so Conrad Hilton is a uh, Christmas day baby. And had an affair with Zsa, Zsa The son did. Possibly. Yes. Maybe. Okay. Some people speculate that. I came across that tidbit for an earlier episode. Conrad Hilton... Mm-hmm is a December 25th baby. He's a Christmas Day baby. Born in 1887 in San Antonio before Texas was a state. (laughs) Conrad grows up working in his dad's general store, which later goes on to include a 10-room hotel. He serves a two-year stint in the Army during World War I. He will serve in New Mexico's first state legislature before becoming a banker. He decides to move to Texas and arrives just in time for the oil boom. People are flocking. I was going to say Mardi Gras, but. (laughs) People are flocking to the area. Mm -hmm. And Conrad's like, they're going to need a place to stay. Yeah, right. Easy money. Yeah. So he scraps his banking plans and buys a 40-room hotel in Cisco, Texas instead. 
this works out for him. Hmm. Soon he has a scratch to buy and build hotels across the state. He opens the Dallas Hilton in 1925. Other Hilton hotels follow in Abilene, Waco, El Paso. He expands into New Mexico, opening a hotel in Albuquerque before the Great Depression will knock him like so many others on the chin. He will lose several of his hotels, but the new owners retain him as manager and he eventually regains control of the chain. By the 1950s, old Conrad owns 188 hotels across 38 states. Wow. He has expanded his operations overseas, making Hilton Hotels the first international hotel chain. Along the way, he will have four children with three wives. Zsa, Zsa for him, wife number two. Of her marriage, Zsa, Zsa will write, Conrad's decision to change my name from Zsa, Zsa to Georgia symboled everything my marriage to him would eventually become. My Hungarian roots were to be ripped out and my background ignored. I soon discovered that my marriage to Conrad meant the end of my freedom. My own needs were completely ignored. I belonged to Conrad. After their divorce, hmm. Zsa, Zsa said, Conrad Hilton was very generous to me in the divorce settlement. He gave me 5,000 Gideon Bibles. <laughs> She's such a broad, man. Okay. 1947. Zsa, Zsa will give birth to her only child and the only Gabor grandchild. She has a daughter named Constance Francesca Hilton on March the 10th, 1947. Now, here's what's kind of crap. Zsa, Zsa will later say that her daughter was the product of marital rape. Other reports allege that Zsa, Zsa conceived the child during an affair with her stepson and future husband of Elizabeth Taylor, Nikki Hilton. Conrad Hilton reportedly wasn't sure the child was his, but he agreed to put his name on the birth certificate. So, Sasha, in your story? Sachi, I believe. Sachi, in your story, did not have an easy time of it. Neither did Francesca mm -hmm. Hilton. When her father died, he left most of his $200 million fortune to his charitable foundation. She contested the will, but lost and was left with an inheritance of $100,000. When Zsa Zsa's health begins to decline, Francesca fights for a court-appointed conservator, alleging her stepfather was mismanaging her mother's money and medical care and preventing Francesca from seeing Zsa Zsa. This is last husband. We're going to call him Fake Prince. Fake Prince denied the charges, eventually settles with Francesca out of court, agreeing to regular visits and reports to Francesca's lawyer. In 2005, Fake Prince retaliates by filing suit against Francesca, alleging forgery and fraud when she sought to refinance her mother's mansion in order to save it from foreclosure. The case was dismissed due to lack of evidence, but it led to an estrangement from her mother who was all but incapacitated by that time by multiple medical problems. Francesca dies January 5th, 2015 at Cedar sinai Medical Center at the age of 67. She had been living in her car at that time. Jeez. Of her last stepfather, the fake prince, Francesca says, my mother wanted to be a princess, so she married an evil queen. Yikes. Rawr. Hubby number three. In 1949, Zsa Zsa will marry George Sanders. We talked about him and their nefariousness last week where it concerned Ruby Rosa. George Sanders was born July 2nd, 1906 in St. Petersburg, Russia. Legend has it that his father was the illegitimate son of a prince of the House of Oldenburg. The family flees the Russian Revolution, resettling in London in 1917. George attends Manchester Technical College, works in the textile trade after graduation. But fabric's not enough for young George, and he ends up managing a tobacco plantation in South America until the Depression kicks him back to England. He finds work in an ad agency, 
becoming friends with the receptionist, whose name is Greer Garson, who will go on to spend the 1940s starring in MGM movies and collecting Oscar nominations. Interesting. Greer's like, hey, George, you should think about acting. George could sing a little, and he was able to find work as a chorus boy and cabaret performer. He's soon racking up radio and stage credits in London, then New York. He returns to England to make films, some of which are distributed by 20th Century Fox in the United States. 20th Century Fox is in the market for a villain with a posh British accent for a Tyrone power film called Lloyds of London. George Sanders, because of his posh British accent, gets the job, which leads to roles opposite everyone from Dolores Del Rio to Gloria Stewart, who played the octogenarian Rose in Titanic. Okay. RKO cast George as a modern Robin Hood in The Saint, a series of B-movies before Hitchcock, books him for roles in Rebecca and Foreign Correspondent. He's really good in Rebecca. I think Rebecca is one of my favorite films ever. I love it so hard. Okay. It's so good. I did not know that. It really is good. Oh, Joan Fontaine. Oh. By the 1940s, George Sanders was an A-list star and married to an actress named Susan Larson. He won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of the suavely sinister theater critic in 1950's All About Eve. The year before that, he divorced his wife and became Zsa Zsa Gabor's third husband on April Fool's Day. Hmm. Seems like a good day to marry Zsa Zsa Gabor. I don't know if this was an April Fool's trick, but uh, he used Conrad Hilton's ring to seal the deal. Zsa Zsa gives up $25,000 in alimony. From Conrad? Correct. That's how you know she liked George okay. I never hated a man so much I gave back his diamonds. Okay. So after years of Zsa Zsa stepping out on George Sanders, most notably with wonder stud Ruby Rosa, George Sanders files for divorce, citing mental cruelty. They divorce in 1954, but let's just do a little follow up on George Sanders. He publishes an autobiography called Memoirs of a Professional Cad. In 1960. In 1970, remember George Sanders married Zsa Zsa's older sister Magda? I had not remembered that, actually. That marriage lasted, you want to take a guess, at how many days? Was it many thousands of days? 32. (laughs) Was it many thousands of seconds? George Sanders will die on April 25th, 1972, after ingesting five bottles of Nembutal. Wow. He leaves behind three suicide notes, including one that reads, Dear world, I am leaving because I am bored. I feel like I've lived long enough. I am leaving you with your worries in this sweet cesspool. Good luck. But there were two other notes. Mm Mm-hmm. Just in case the first point didn't get across. When the news of George's suicide broke, Zsa Zsa said that George Sanders was the major love of my life. After his death, his friend, the actor Brian Ahern, will write George's biography entitled A Dreadful Man. George had suggested that title himself before his death. In his book, George Sanders will write, whatever else could be said about Zsa Zsa, she has a lot of guts. Hubby three done. So let's talk about this for a second, because I remember pre-Kardashian world when the Kardashians were not a thing. Mm -hmm. Right? They just, they weren't a thing. I know. There was a time when I had never heard the name, and it was a good time. And then they were a thing, and Mm -hmm. there's Momager and the three sisters, and they just, it it was a wave. And then they were just ubiquitous within the culture for being famous. Not necessarily because of their accomplishments, but just like celebutons. Mm -hmm. We're famous because we're famous. I don't know if they started it. Paris Hilton is going to have her own thing doing it. Zsa Zsa Gabor's step-granddaughter is Paris Hilton. 
But there's something very Kardashian-esque about the Gabor sisters and their mom, Jolie, with Chris and Kim, Courtney, Chloe, <clears throat> that one day they weren't there and then one day they were there. Mom has been waiting to do this. 1951, Zsa, Zsa has been in the United States for 10 years. Been through two marriages. But in 1951, Zsa, Zsa accepts a spot as a last minute replacement on a TV show called Bachelor's Haven. The format is like daytime talk TV. Guests giving relationship advice to callers. Zsa, Zsa will show up in an off-the-shoulder designer gown and a 20-carat diamond solitaire, diamond earrings, and a bracelet to match. The host naturally is like, my goodness, look at those diamonds. And Zsa, Zsa quips, oh, these? These are just my working diamonds. Oh my God. A star was born. After this, Zsa, Zsa later writes, like, I couldn't even go out on the streets of Los Angeles without being mobbed by crowds of fans. It had all happened so quickly as everything in my life seems to happen. Famous for being famous. I, well, this is why I don't go outside either. Just <laughs> the mobs. Whew. In 1952, hmm. Zsa, Zsa will make her major Hollywood motion picture debut in a film called Lovely to Look At. But her breakthrough role will come later that year in a film called Moulin Rouge. She will go on to make 14 films in the 1950s. But her witty appearances and darling and over-the-top mm -hmm. appearances on talk shows and variety programs are far more memorable than any film role she does. In 1956, after her divorce from George Sanders, they will star together in Death of a Scoundrel. Jaja kind of takes a break for a minute, but don't worry. There's another husband on the horizon. 1962, Jaja will marry a man named Herbert Hunter. Herbert Loeb Hunter is a December 21st baby, 1908. After earning both an undergraduate and a law degree from Columbia University, Herbert is going to go on to work on Wall Street partnering with future Broadway producer Lester Osterman in a brokerage. Hunter eventually serves as the president of New England Life Insurance Company before marrying Zsa, Zsa He will become an investment banker and move to Beverly Hills. So perhaps the most notable aspect of their relationship was his habit of sending her your... You thought... Porfirio Ruby Rose's one rose thing was a thing. Herbert will send Zsa, Zsa two dozen roses every half hour on her birthday. Okay, that's actually, that's sweet. A thousand yellow daisies. It's very sweet. But let's do the maths on that for a second. Well, it's contained to... A day. Right. He's not doing that every single day. Yeah, but four dozen roses for 24 for at okay a those poor delivery people mm -hmm. i have questions about how you tip for that do you tip on every one or is the same guy just waiting in his van with dozens and dozens of roses and just like i'm on 24 hour stakeout i just go up every 30 minutes take a little nap in between do you just tip the guy a few hundred bucks and say bring them all in it's cool man i'm taking a nap i'm having a drink i'm having a snack i don't want to answer the door every 30 minutes I have questions. These seem like good questions. In his later years, Herbert Hunter will become the chairman of the President's Advisory Committee on the Arts under George H.W. Bush and was co-founder of the Los Angeles Music Center. Zsa, Zsa will be his second wife. At the time of their marriage, Zsa, Zsa says, I'm going to work very hard to make it my last Spoiler alert. <laughs> it was not her last. The couple divorces four years later. Zsa, Zsa later writes that the problem was Herbert took away my will to work. With his kindness and generosity, he almost annihilated my drive. 
I have always been the kind of woman who would never be satisfied by money. <laughs> Only excitement and achievement. I think that might not be true. But <clears throat> Hunter would go on to marry once more before his death in 2008, just two weeks before his 100th birthday. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I don't even know what number that is. You keep in track. That's hubby four. I think that was four. Yeah. Sweet Jesus. All right. 1966. Zsa, Zsa will marry Joshua S. Cosden Jr. One day after her divorce from Hunter is finalized, Zsa, Zsa will marry Dallas oil exec Joshua S. Cosden Jr. They'd met at a party six weeks before. God. I see yeah. that she's at this point genuinely investing in the relationship. No, they like six weeks. six weeks before and they head to Santa Monica to get a marriage license. Everyone assumes that she's married this guy for his money, Dallas oil exec. But uh, it turns out this guy was the gold digger. Mm. By the time the couple exchanges vows, his family fortune is dwindled for millions to $30,000. The marriage lasts 19 months. Yeah. Once she finds out, yeah. Oops. So divorce you said standard oil. Divorce nineteen sixty seven. So mm -hmm. Jaja's gonna take it easy for a minute. She's gonna wait a few years to get married again. But well, she, she needs she needs better financial documentation before she's gonna do that again. Hold on. You're not even ready. You're not even fucking ready for this. Nineteen seventy five. Jaja will marry a dude named Jack Ryan. Not that Jack Ryan. But she said she wanted excitement. <laughs> Patriot Games. <laughs> Hunt for Red Jaja. I don't know. This Jack Ryan is a Yale-trained electronics engineer who has developed missile systems before he takes a sweet corporate job at Mattel and will go on to invent the chatty Kathy doll and Barbie. <laughs> Wait, there's an engineer behind Barbie. I guess there's an would electronics have to be. engineer who develops missile systems. And Barbie. And Barbie and, and Chatty Cathy. Yes. Talking toys and anatomically implausible dolls made him rich enough to buy an 18 bathroom, not bedroom, 18 bathroom estate in Bel Air. Did it Three, also have bedrooms? Or was it just so. a building full of bathrooms? Dude, trashy divorces is dirty as fuck, and I don't know what people do anymore. Like, I have a lot of questions. He buys a Bel Air estate three doors down from Jaja. They get to know each other over the course of a single year in which he throws old Jack Ryan, life of master of excitement, 182 parties in a single year. The couple will marry after a two-month courtship. The groom is 48. Jaja ja will list her age as 46 on the marriage certificate, which would have made her the age of 11 at the time of her first marriage <laughs> and four years old when she competed in the Miss Hungary pageant. <laughs> it's perfect. Perfect. Jack Ryan who'd been married once prior to Zsa, Zsa goes on to marry three more times before passing away in 1991 at the age of 64. Okay. They don't last, like, they don't last more than a year. They're done. But don't worry about Zsa, Zsa. Three days after divorcing Jack Ryan, Zsa, Zsa will marry her latest divorce attorney who handled the <laughs> divorce for her. <laughs> A Beverly Hills lawyer named Michael O'Hara. I feel like he's planning for the future badly. It is the groom's fourth marriage. Well, never mind. And the bride's seventh. Oh, the wedding also takes place in the bridal suite at the Las Vegas Hilton. <laughs> I can't make this podcast up. <laughs> in her autobiography, Zsa Zsa writes, I almost feel like characterizing my marriage to Michael O'Hara by just writing his name and leaving a blank page, I should have listened to my friend Merle Oberon, who cautioned, be careful, I wouldn't marry a lawyer, because that could cost you. 
Did it? Uh, they stay married seven years. They're divorced mm. in 1983. So one of her more successful marriages then. I mean, technically, yes. But uh, don't worry. Because in 1983, when they divorce, Jaja will marry Philippe de Alba for one day. <laughs> Britney Spears, you got <laughs> nothing on this. <laughs> Philippe de Alba is a Mexican attorney and character actor on a yacht anchored off Puerto Vallarta. Unfortunately, technically, legally, She's still married to her previous husband, Michael O'Hara, at the time. Well, who can keep track, really? So the marriage is annulled and a new wedding date was set. But Zsa Zsa opts not to go through with the makeup ceremony. She says, he bored me. He's a playboy and I'm a hardworking actress. De Alba will relocate to New York. He will also appear in... Real Women Have Curves in 2002. He died in 2005 at the age of 81. His one-day union with Zsa Zsa Gabor was his only marriage. Sorry, guy. In 1984, mm-hmm. Zsa Zsa will get into a little bit of a beef with German-born actress Elke Sommer. They are... Starring together in a joint appearance on a little show called Circus of the Stars. Do you remember that from when yeah. you were little? Rings a bell, yeah. Flashbacks. The feud from this spat will escalate into a libel suit. And Zsa Zsa Gabor says some pretty shitty shit about Elke Summer, who will eventually win and be paid $3.3 million in wow. general and punitive damages because Zsa Zsa can't keep her mouth shut. Wow. Everybody take a deep breath. Sorry, dog's feet. Take a breath. 1986. Zsa Zsa will marry her last husband, Frederick Prinz von Anhalt. Ninth and final. This guy's fake prince. The rumor is that this guy buys his title by paying a deposed German royal to adopt him at the age of 36 years old. Wow. So that's really a thing. It's really a thing. This is how, because Germanic royalty does a thing after World War I where they still have like title inherent, but no. So you yeah. can buy and distribute titles at ease. It's pretty hmm. cool. So Frederick, fake prince, Buys his title at the age of 36. But once he marries Zsa, Zsa the two of them will go on to sell his title to as many as 10 men. I've seen it be almost 20 as well. Anywhere from a price of $50,000 to $2 million a piece will buy you a questionable, well, dramatic, fake prince title. Sure. Hey, not everybody can be Brooke Shields. <laughs> so, future monarch of France. Real princess of France. Real queen of France, Brooke Shields. In 1989, Zsa Zsa will slap a police officer mm-hmm. after he pulls over her Rolls Royce convertible. Yeah, I remember this. On Olympic Boulevard in Beverly Hills, June 14th, 1989. Remember these were simpler times? Probably would have been okay Except for when the cops started to pull her over, she put the pedal to the metal. And then when the cop did pull her over, there was a flask of Jack Daniels. I was going to say, it was a drunk driving incident, In the glove right? compartment. Yeah. yeah. The case goes to trial. Zsa Zsa is found guilty of driving without a license and possessing an open container. She's sentenced to 120 hours of community service. Ordered to pay almost $13,000 in restitution and fines. She refuses to do the community service. Why? Eh. So what did what ended up happening to her? She serves three days in the slammer mm-hmm. in the summer in 1990. Okay. <laughs> Zsa Zsa will save the incident. You just cannot drive a Rolls Royce in Beverly Hills anymore. They have it in for you. In 2002, a car crash on Sunset Boulevard will leave Zsa Zsa partially paralyzed. A little trashy spiderweb here. In 2009, 
Zsa is going to get burned by Bernie Madoff to the tune of about $10 million, really? according to some reports. Wow. Yeah. Because of the accident previous and the paralyzation in 2011, Zsa Zsa has an, uh, one of her legs amputated due to complications from a blood clot. Wow. December 28th, 2016, Zsa, Zsa Gabor will die at the UCLA Medical Center after a long illness. She was seven weeks shy of her 100th birthday. That is really remarkable. And that one of her ex, I mean, again, it seems like she was trying to get a good cross section of the population, but that one of her exes would also invent like, Barbie. Well, no, but I mean, live to within weeks of his 100th birthday. Um, oh, that that yeah. is that is remarkable. Good for both of them, I guess. Oh, can I tell you about fake prints? Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave it on a really sweet quote from Zsa, Zsa and give her the last word. But fake prints husband thinks perhaps he could be one of the fathers of Anna Nicole Smith's daughter. Oh, he's one of those guys. It was Larry Burkhalter, right? I think that's the guy's name. But he's involved in that. Also, fake prints gets held up by a gang of lesbian carjackers. Trashy tidbits this week is going to be lit on Patreon. Okay. There are gangs of lesbian carjackers? Apparently, like, gangs of lesbian carjackers. You learned something in new. In Beverly Hills. <laughs> I mean, why not? Lesbians drive cars. Patreon, yeah. <laughs> There's so much I could not get in. Like, the trashy divorces all-star, right? Nine husbands, seven divorces, one annulment. Of course you're in the lineup. I need to hear more about this gang. It's a good story. Thursday. Thursday on Patreon. Okay. So I'm going to give the last word to Zsa, Zsa All my life, I've been a positive thinker. I have always been able to survive by telling myself that no matter how bad things are, they will one day be better. And that out of every event, no matter how tragic, one can always find a way to survive and even perhaps to be a little bit happy. Those are the trashy divorces of Zsa Zsa Gabor. The very, very many trashy divorces. I'm pretty smart in math. I don't even know how to compute garbage cans. Mm -hmm. Trash cans for this one are a mystery. Maybe as many as 10. Between 8 but and 10. But what galaxy? <laughs> This one was everywhere. Yeah. This was a fun up. Yeah. <laughs> we have aliens, clones, multiple husbands, mothers who aren't terrific. Not terrific mothers. Yeah, I would say that Zsa, Zsa should get as many as eight trash cans of varying ages. You know what? I'm going to go 21 trash cans. Okay. The number of suitcases she showed up with oh, in yeah. 1941. But all of those trash cans are encrusted with fake diamonds and filled with Barbie dolls. Yeah, that seems solid. And oil. And Hilton Hotels. And bottles of Jack Daniels. Zsa Zsa Gabor, Trashy Divorces All-Star. I don't know how you... You just try to tell the story the best you can. One more week of trashy divorces. Done and done. That's my primer on Zsa Zsa Gabor. Mm -hmm. Until we see you next Sunday. Y'all, come see us on Saturday. Oh, yeah. At yeah. my art show at Kavarna. Mm -hmm. In Oakhurst. In and Oakhurst. Like 7 o'clock, 7.30. There's going to be art. Lori Ray is going to be playing. It's going to be a lot of fun. This week on Patreon, holy cats, Ocean's Eleven this week. I'm getting in to the trashy mystery of everyone's favorite columnist, game show host, smart girl, Dorothy Kilgallen. It's going to be a great story. We've got all kinds of other fun stuff coming up. Consider joining us over there at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. I think that does us for another week. Make sure you wash your hands, and that's not even a joke. No, there's no joking about mm -mm. that. I mean, keep it trashy, but lots of soap. Keep it super trashy, but with clean hands. Mm -hmm. 
Stop touching your face. Okay. We'll be back next week. <laughs> Go forth and be trashy mm-hmm. with sanitized hands. And your N95 masks. Cheers, y'all. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Y'all are the very best. Until we see you next week, Bye. keep it trashy. Keep it trashy. Bye. Bye. Trash Pandas, thanks for listening. Trashy Divorces is written and produced by us, Stacy and Alicia, for Hemlock Creatives. You can contact us at trashydivorces at gmail.com. Our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy Store on Instagram. Big thanks to our Season 5 associate producer, Melanie Z. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at TrashyDivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at Patreon.com slash TrashyDivorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at Trashy Divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we, we split. split. We also have a Trashy Divorces discussion group on Facebook if you want to chat with other Trashy Divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep, Keep it, it trashy, trashy y'all.